Good morning. My name is Philip Bain. I'm the managing director of the Smart Cities Council. Uh, today I have with me with Jeff Benavides, the Chief Sustainability and Resilience Officer for Orange County, uh, Florida. So today we're going to do a deep dive into the Orange County Convention Center requirements. Jeff um, is going to present them. But just for those of you that maybe this is the first time that you have attended a Smart Cities Council Readiness Program event, let me just quickly go over with you what we're trying to do. Um, and what we're trying to do here is uh, using Orange County as our readiness cohort leader, they're a winner. Um, we try to help other cities uh, plan and accelerate projects of a common need. And here the need is smart and healthy buildings. Um, we help accelerate project implementation. And, and our view is that if we do that, the city residents win, financiers, solution providers, and then of course the city. Um, we, we take one or two cities per quarter. Right now we're working with Nashville, uh, Brisbane, and all, Queensland, Australia, and the, the county, Orange County, Florida. Um, those cities that participate and listen in will get free access to Smart Cities Activator, the only online collaborative planning platform for cities. Um, just to give you an overview of the program, these are the many states, uh, provinces, cities that have won around the world. Uh, the challenge was primarily for the first three years in North America, but I mean, sorry, in the US and we've expanded it to North America and Australia since. Um, our current winners, as I said, were Nashville, Orange County, and uh, Brisbane. Um, you know, we're looking at a holistic approach on buildings. I and mean, uh, Jeff is going to really do a deep dive into the convention center, but I just wanna remind everybody, we're looking at all the use cases that arise from uh, building occupancy in the buildings. Um, but we're also looking at what happens between buildings, not just inside, but also between the buildings. So we're also taking a district approach. Um, our team includes me, Connie Heath, the Director of City Engagement, Peter Murray, the Executive Director, who's in, who lives in Orlando, and then Steve Kraut, the Director of our Policy Task Force. So with that said, let me introduce Jeff Benavides, Jeff, I'm going to turn the um, the screen over to you. Just give me a second here. You should have it now, Jeff. All right, here we go. How's that look? We can see your um, your uh, main screen. Okay, there's the presentation. You just may want to bring it. There you go. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. All right. So good afternoon, or sorry, good morning, still everybody. Uh, my name is Jeff Benavidez, as Philip mentioned. I am the Orange County Chief Sustainability and Resilience Officer. I am here uh, representing a few uh, different departments. We're going to do a deep dive today uh, to make use of this time the best uh, with the Orange County Convention Center as one of the four projects that we've selected for uh, this pilot program and as a deep dive into um, some of the building uh, innovations and smart and healthy building cohort that we've designed uh, with the Smart Cities Council. So uh, just as a quick recap, we did choose uh, four different very unique buildings, one of which is the Orange County Convention Center, which is a, a pinnacle property of ours, uh, along with the courthouse building, uh, which is the main Orange County courthouse that serves this entire district. Um, it's about a 40-story building. Um, and we also uh, chose one of our smaller community centers, which is uh, newer, um, that we can make some uh, modifications to, as well as uh, our public works complex, which is a more distributed uh, more representative for a lot of our uh, back of house facilities, where it has a lot of traffic, internal traffic of uh, various levels of vehicles, as well as equipment um, and office. So we're utilizing those kind of four representative building categories through our Smart and Healthy Building Readiness Cohort to kind of help us understand some of these needs um, and opportunities across all of our different county facilities which is about 565 different you know, uh, actual built brick and mortar uh, facilities that we have countywide. And hopefully with, by doing this, we're also 
providing some insight in, uh, for other cities and municipalities that join us since we are uh, not unique. Uh, we're unique, unique in many ways, but from a built environment standpoint, we have many commonalities with our peers. So hopefully making it worthwhile for the Central Florida uh, buildings environment. So let's go ahead and just get started. And I'll go ahead and uh, everyone can see my screen. I'll make sure that is full screen for everyone to see. All right, perfect. All right, so as I mentioned, for those of you that did not uh, able to attend the uh, first kickoff session, uh, Kanye, I would appreciate it if you could uh, drop in the chat the link to the kickoff just so you can see some context as well as hear directly from Mayor Demings, uh, who is our county mayor. And we're doing this in light of the three pillars that he always asks us uh, is innovation, collaboration, and inclusion. And that's uh, those are very bold pillars, and we use that as everything we do and look at it through those lens um, as we move forward in our community. So uh, during that uh, uh, during that session, we talked a little bit about Orange County, the context, and so on, as well as the scope of this project and a little bit more background as to how we got here. Um, but just for some context for today, we're, as we're deep and dive into the Orange County Convention Center, uh, this fun fact about one resident for every 62 tourists each year, which is pretty uh, incredible. So uh, that incredible impact as far as the services that we have to provide as a community to not only the tourists that come here and attendees that come here from a variety of different um, convention services, but then also the residents that we're working on, as Philip mentioned, trying to make it uh, a two-way street or benefit. And I know that the Convention Center uh, project, this is a very unique building, as I mentioned. Welcome, Mayor so Deming. My name is Philip Payne, sir. I'm the... Oh. Sorry about that. That was me. I was getting the link. <laughs> so... Yeah, no, that's good. Go ahead, Jeff. It works. Um, uh, as I mentioned, the Convention Center is uh, a unique facility where a lot of our residents don't necessarily go to the Convention Center unless they're going to see a, a show or they're working there, such as our boat show or uh, any random show um, that we host there or an event that is hosted there. But honestly, we don't have a, a whole, from the whole resident population, very little amount of people, um, frankly, try to avoid the convention center area because of traffic and so on. Uh, although uh, during our pandemic timeframe, our convention center has been a staple in community response. In fact, the first FEMA site for COVID testing as well as vaccination. So we're very proud of the community engagement and utilizing the asset that we have for response in our community. So um, people have been very, uh, have come to realize how valuable the asset is here locally uh, through the last year. Uh, so keeping moving forward in, um, in traditional years, uh, our economic development impact of the convention center is rather large. Here's a nice little panoramic view of uh, the north-south building. There are two buildings, and I have a map on the next page that shows you a little bit more for context. Um, but it's, it's rather large. We have uh, about 30,000 people that are employed within the convention district alone and showcasing how important the convention and trade show business is here for Orange County. It's not just Disney and Universal and our great theme parks and entertainment. It's also the amount of convention uh, district, about 30 to 40 percent of the total 75 million that come per year come actually to uh, to the convention center. So uh, about 200 events that we host per year, uh, these range uh, incredibly from small little conferences to weddings, to dinners, to uh, what we call citywide events, which close down both buildings and all five hotels right around it, uh, 150,000 people um, sometimes that they, they close down the, the city for it. So again, it, a lot of attendees that come uh, per, per year is, uh, is a huge, it's a huge way of, uh, of doing. And one other uh, key point with our convention center is that sometimes our attendees are coming to our convention center and we're hosting the main event, but then all of the connected hotels right around um, the convention center are physically connected by bridges and pedestrian bridges that we have installed, similar to uh, what Las Vegas has on the Strip. 
Um, but those they're very strategically placed and designed so that people can go in and out. So a lot of times those convention centers are also hosting, those hotels are also hosting events in relation to another event um, that's happening at the same time. So again, this interoperability as this vision of this uh, district that we have, how can we all interconnect knowing that we can only control the convention center, not the Hilton, not the Hyatt, not the Rosen uh, Center, but how can we all agree and work through different building technology so that that guest has that seamless experience um, uh, from, from building to building and there's some sense of consistency. Uh, I mentioned this before, but uh, I'll talk about one other key thing on this screen. The second largest convention center, about 7 million square feet total indoor space. Uh, exhibit halls and meeting rooms uh, primarily, as well as some small office and back of house space. Um, the key certifications I wanted to make sure I mentioned, I uh, spent very little time on it before. Uh, the convention center since 2015 has been uh, lead gold for existing building certified um, uh, for the North South building. Um, and a lot of the policies and procedures, of course, uh, bleed out to the other building as well, although that building was not uh, certified uh, yet. And uh, for any further expansion of the uh, convention center that we have on deck for some time in the future, uh, we did press pause on that expansion that had already been awarded um, uh, last year uh, due to the economic condition. But our uh, the, the expansion would happen at this north-south building, adding an additional about a million and a half uh, square feet. So I did want to mention that we follow the LEED Gold uh, for existing building standards. So for those of you that are familiar with that, that is uh, kind of a, our, our key alignment there um, for all of our operations and maintenance activities. And also wanted to mention the GBAC STAR certification. This is a newer certification that evolved last year. And many venues and event locations have started to do that. We were one of the first convention centers that did it. Last year, this is particularly for bio-risk, pandemic response, and cleaning standards, as well as air quality standards. So um, I would encourage uh, any technologies that we're looking at and in integrations that we can align with the GBAC STAR and meeting the goals of GBAC STAR because they have very uh, strict guidelines with regards to pandemic response, cleaning, as well as indoor air quality, and so on. So it's a good point there and that, um, program is uh, evolving um, daily uh, with the different applications that are out there. And lastly, the ISO 14001 uh, EMS, this is an environmental management system that we have for our recycling and cleaning services and um, departments. So um, I, I don't believe we'll be touching much of the alignment of that certification. However, uh, any type of building procedure that we have, uh, that we like to develop uh, in line with the ISO standard, uh, but that primarily services our waste and cleaning um, services there. So play, uh, please pay such special attention to those, um, those two certifications primarily. Uh, just to give you a little bit of an overview of the uh, district as well as the um, two buildings, you'll see the north-south building here on the top square, and then the west building, which is actually the larger building, um, on the bottom square. The West Building was the first building that was built in phases. And for those of you in construction and mechanical and electrical, obviously it's been many years from 1980, I think it was 1982, the first phase was open. And then all the way up until last year, there has been phases open. So as you can imagine, it is truly a, um, going through history and time of mechanical equipment, electrical equipment, furnishings, fixtures, and so on. And we try to keep that consistency, but of course, back of house, um, there's still a lot of upgrades and why we're doing this engagement is uh, to showcase and align some of those upgrades to help meet you know, the current technologies uh, available with, uh, with building systems and um, healthy buildings. So uh, aside from that, the district uh, is, is rather uh, compact. Um, as I mentioned, the pedestrian walkways do connect one, two, three, uh, four uh, hotels, and um, we try to elevate that. That's, those are above uh, above the road bridges, um, 
so people don't have to get back onto the roads. So it's very connected from that perspective. Um, our goal for this Smart Cities Healthy Buildings for the Convention Center particularly is to uh, craft a, a strong back-to-business strategy um, to have uh, our occupants and guests and clients that want to rebook shows and go back to in-person events feel comfortable and the confidence level being elevated and really showcasing it as an innovation for how we've been able to respond as well as operate and continue to operate throughout the uh, pandemic. And uh, as we get into this new phase of uh, having events come back uh, into in-person and having conferences, how are we leading by example uh, through our communities and uh, really changing the way that we operate and um, really respond to events and large crowds as well. So our, our key, other key is the launching customer facing applications for some improved user experiences, knowing that uh, the in-person uh, events have changed quite a bit. We'll have more hybrid events. We will have uh, some more opportunities for digital uh, engagements. Uh, with different attendees, so uh, which is good, uh, good, good for business, and we want to really showcase that and get in line with uh, many other types of facilities that are uh, leading in this arena. So we have uh, several goals that we're going to hit on today. Uh, all of the goals for the scope of this project hit in this human experience category and the buildings and infrastructure category. Uh, obviously, we're, we're not touching too much on materials management, supply chain, or transportation or accessibility. Um, from uh, that, that, I mean, there, there are some uh, connections there, but primarily for this human experience, which includes comfort and air quality, as well as overall customer service, and then uh, buildings and infrastructure, which are, are the harder assets. So the county has set uh, three goals and just wanted to review these goals that I mentioned last time. Uh, we have goals that beginning this year, we uh, are creating and designing new high performance uh, green buildings uh, to a set of green building standards. We have not standardized to a particular um, recognized national standard. However, this building, as I mentioned, is already LEED certified and any construction at the convention center campus will be LEED certified. Uh, in the future. Um, so that particularly for the convention center is our goal is uh, the LEED certification standard. However, we do have uh, several other buildings across the county that we would be looking at other certification standards as well. Um, the alignment of an energy management strategy, uh, particularly for 30% of uh, reductions in energy use by this 2025 timeline. So. Uh, as a asset this large, 7 million square feet, um, it is quite the large slice uh, for us in our whole energy management profile, which is another reason why we wanted to focus on this building as well as our courthouse and larger infrastructure projects that really will drive that needle of that 35% 30 um, forward. So, of course, this building is rather unique because we don't fully control or have the ability to fully control uh, indoor comfort, obviously that's dictated by our shows and our clients, but it's obviously our job to make sure that it is running as efficiently as possible despite um, the limitations of uh, <laughs> turning up the temperature in an exhibit hall and then getting complaints. So that's a careful balance that we have for this uh, project here specifically. Um, and then lastly, reducing risks for county services and all of our infrastructure. Uh, for a variety of indicators. So uh, particularly for this area, we've been talking more about preventative maintenance and we'll get to, uh, to that in a second. So with these goals, we expect to achieve in the context of this uh, project here is uh, safety and health, as I already mentioned, uh, that occupant level of comfort, um, not just for while you're here, but also while you're potentially booking uh, an event and hesitant about coming to the convention center we have activated a series of tools as well as onboarding and informational videos that walk uh, individuals through what to expect when they come here and how do we operate meetings as safe as possible. So we're looking to obviously keep that going as well as further enhance that 
level of confidence in order to uh, maintain business development and um, economic development for the region. Last, uh, also cost savings, uh, of course, building operations, efficiencies, and risk mitigation. Uh, infrastructure asset tracking is something I mentioned before, and we'll dive in further today. Um, and then I've mentioned already the human experience, and then this uh, revenue co-generation. I'll talk about that in a second too, just if I wasn't clear uh, before on this idea. So getting back into the details of the metrics and KPIs as to how we're going to measure success as a result of this project is to uh, for safety and health honestly we do satisfaction surveys for all of our clients pre and post and even during um, we track all of those customer engagements during the process to uh, sit back and analyze how we performed how our response times were um, what issues came about came about during the events and we have a very robust tracking system that does do those uh, touch points that we can step back and look to see are we meeting those expectations that that we're that we're setting from a safety and health standpoint air quality and a dashboard is one of the things that we would love to see um, having the ability for um, uh, uh, attendees and clients to really see real time as they're walking through our lobbies walking through the conference rooms even um, or through the exhibit halls, real-time uh, information on the indoor environment. Are there any vulnerabilities? What's the temperature like? Uh, any type of new age and, of course, new types of intel that people are looking for uh, on the ground. And, of course, this offers an opportunity to see what others are doing and learn from other buildings of our size and other public spaces of our size to see what people are really interested in knowing to know that this is a safe environment and a healthy environment inside. Uh, so that's one, one key thing that we would love to see is some of that uh, shareable dashboard. Of course, there's a whole hardware component that we would need to get there. It's not just a uh, fancy software. Obviously, a lot of uh, hardware would need to be considered for uh, these expansion or uh, for a dashboard such as this. Um, cost savings, we will measure that through building operation efficiencies as well as cost mitigation or risk mitigation. So we do quite a bit of maintenance and repairs on this building, as you can imagine, with 7 million square feet. So we have a very busy work order system and we can track all the efficiencies or uh, mitigation of cost, uh, whether it's leaks or repairs or whatever. We can track all that on our back end with the implementation of new technology that would essentially mitigate that uh, cost for us. So uh, that would be uh, a key goal. And of course, the metrics as you know, labor hours, uh, work orders, the number of work orders, completion time of work orders, um, aside from the key metrics from an energy, water, and chilled water um, usage standpoint, and of course, the utility cost. and uh, expenditures that come with those uh, savings. So um, this is an opportunity for us to provide that data up front um, so that we can show what our current energy use and water use profile or work order profile is for this building or for these buildings particularly. And we can actually use it and verify it with our uh, building automation system and load management system um, at the same time. So really trying to prove Prove that the technologies are working and we have a, a way to uh, to measure that. Uh, this revenue co-generation um, uh, item is interesting just because we, we have the opportunity as the convention center, one of the largest uh, in the country or second largest in the country, we have a lot of shows that come to town, a very diverse set of shows that come to town and clients. Um, but it would be our goal to expand and look for different opportunities as to how, as the center, are we enabling additional revenue opportunities for not only the clients that are coming here, but also the companies that are looking to do expos and showcase their products or services while they're here. So um, I've pulled together some metrics and KPIs that we discussed on how we could measure uh, what that really means. In other words, how could we uh, launch a location-based app potentially um, that would allow for uh, shows and companies that are participating in these shows 
to actively market uh, to the individuals that are coming or even our local restaurants market to uh, the, re the, the folks that are coming. Uh, we, we don't have those capabilities right now, aside from what Google Maps is you know, providing people automatically on our phones uh, or Apple Maps. But we'd like to take that a next level so that we can help foster those types of engagements and ads and clicks to the individuals that are uh, coming here and experiencing um, the show. Another way that we'll measure some of this stuff more on a long-term scale um, is company relocations. Um, we have, with the amount of shows and companies that do come here, how can we as a community and an economic development department and team capture some of those companies that want to call Orlando home? Um, and how can we teach them about the values of being here, our workforce, our livability here in the community, and really capturing all these companies in a more sophisticated way than just transactional. Uh, moving from that transactional, you're just coming from the event, but how do we actually enable economic development for our community by uh, keeping, you know, creating workforce here locally and having them relocate um, or even open up an office or a branch uh, in our community? That would be uh, huge. Um, research to commercialization. So this is also another opportunity. Um, you know, we have large uh, companies that come here. Uh, Cisco, for example, is one of our larger uh, companies that uh, do citywide conventions. And imagine if we had a very clear and uh, clean um, way to promote the technology that we have here in Orlando from Orlando locals and have that ability to have those small entrepreneurs pitch to these larger companies and create that research to commercialization pipeline and even show some of these larger companies that come here all the research that we have going on with our various universities and various research institutions here locally. So that's one of our key goals as well as to how do we really foster that because that's how we build the community of tomorrow starts with really the community assets that we have here locally and bringing those to development. Orlando has been recognized on many lists on having a good entrepreneur spirit. And we have this very good startup system, um, but one of the um, tasks that my peer, uh, the Innovation and uh, Emerging Technology Officer for Orange County has, is to really sustain those businesses and have them keep uh, uh, sustaining here locally in, um, in Orange County. So uh, she's very focused around how do we utilize uh, and promote uh, with all the folks that do come here uh, from a tourism and um, convention standpoint. So we'll measure that obviously mergers, acquisitions, percentage of local sales, uh, number of local jobs created and a variety of different metrics. Uh, of course, this is something newer uh, for all of us that we've not had a targeted economic development initiative around this, but this is something that uh, we have discussed and want to start putting strategy around as I presented last time and the mayor outlined last time uh, we met. Okay, I'll, uh, uh, Phil, do we have time for questions? Do we do wanna do questions at the end? So we kinda wanna stop there before we uh, continue. I just have a few more slides left, but they're rather uh, detailed. Um, yeah, we'll do questions at the end. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned at the first uh, item, uh, first session, but to get more specific for the convention center, our applications are as follows here on this slide. So uh, one thing I wanna make sure everyone's keeping in mind is this large area, long range. So the ability for remote monitoring and remote alarms and really showing that cost savings of, well, we don't have to wire it uh, or we need more wireless devices, not just on wireless Wi-Fi, but also other types of communication protocols that um, will work from a long range or even short range device uh, standpoint. But we do have quite a bit of infrastructure that's just really vast. Um, as you can imagine with a building of this size, we have a lot of long corridors. We have uh, a lot of doors. <laughs> we have a lot of uh, piping, uh, electrical uh, wiring, um, in just very long ranges. So it's actually great applications because we'd be looking to pilot these types of technologies 
and then look to see where these technologies make sense in other facilities that are also long range that are not necessarily indoor, such as like a water treatment plant, um, but a water treatment plant is going to have the same issues and challenges uh, that we may have in this level of building of size. Um, so just wanted a key, key caveat as far as a priority is that remote access and uh, we may not have power or may not make, it may not be cost effective to run power and ethernet out to a certain location for one sensor point. Um, but really making that business case is like, okay, how, how, do, we, how do we achieve the goal while not um, you know, increasing our costs and level of sophistication with technology? Um, indoor air quality, health and safety monitoring, that's uh, very key and I've already talked about that as well, showing that dashboard uh, example, measuring VOCs, particulates, uh, and so on. I have another slide on the HVAC uh, system in a moment. Um, electric and gas water for whole building data. So this is essentially just uh, whether it's a set of CTs or another type of metering technology that we can install at our utility meter, not for plug load or panel man monitoring because we already have, partially, we already have a plug load and panel monitoring system. However, it's very difficult to tap into that system and just get our monthly KWH for a meter. Um, so short of, essentially our goal is to eliminate that electric bill or eliminate the, the having to look at the electric bill and the utility bill um, as the um, as the main source, we'd like to just digitize that. And this is a manageable property as we only have about 20 or so uh, utility meters, uh, which is good um, in this case. So we don't have um, a whole lot of uh, complexity when it comes to that. So a technology that we can do that whole building data uh, monthly, weekly, and even daily um, type of uh, tech, which we, we currently don't have that consistency across both buildings. Um, the life safety systems, a key point for applications there. We talked a little bit about that, the first uh, engagement. Uh, leak detection, this is also connected to that predictive maintenance. So we have leak detection right now in certain areas, especially for our chilled water lines um, that we've been installing, but they're more low tech um, technologies that are that they don't report back to our centralized um, system. We, you'd have to be in the area in order to understand that there was a leak occurring uh, in that area. So again, this predictive maintenance would be wonderful if we can figure out a way to um, understand our pumps and what is happening at the pump at any given time, um, or that which not just the circulation pumps but booster pumps and water lines. And again, remembering that we have quite a bit of range that we have to deal with. Um, are, there, are there certain technologies that we can look at for different tech uh, checkpoints throughout the building um, so that we can you know, see what's happening in the system if there are any vulnerabilities and really assessing those vulnerabilities from an infrastructure uh, standpoint. CCTV upgrade enhancements. On the next slide, I'll let you know uh, some of the different, uh, you know, products that we use right now. So how do we upgrade our CCTV uh, on the software side, as well as some of the hardware, but um, software side to help us uh, respond to situations better, um, be more proactive, um, which does require some AI integrations that we uh, have looked at in the past, but also other types of technologies that we could add to the CCTV uh, system um, in order to achieve some of those other uh, priorities like indoor air quality, health, um, and electricity and energy monitoring. Uh, lastly, the digitization of assets and uh, tracking that performance, uh, similar to the predictive maintenance conversation, is looking at how do we better track our con the current condition of the variety of assets that we have in the convention center, whether it's air handler units, refrigerator units, uh, tables and chairs, what, whatever it is, we can. Uh, if there's uh, better ways that we could track those assets, where they are, how they're uh, performing, and so on. Uh, some of the desired control points that we would like to see, um, we do have some of these control points in some of our newer systems, of course, that we are retrofitting. But as I mentioned to you, we have those two buildings, uh, all different vintages of equipment, 
So uh, these are kind of those uh, minimum desired HVAC control points and monitoring points that we would love to see um, at a more low cost uh, level. I mean, we, we do have replacement schedules, of course, for our air handler units and some of our uh, building systems and control systems. But um, again, if there are lower tech solutions that we can do and uh, add to these is really our, our focus, um, despite just fully replacing them, which we will be doing uh, and we are doing. But again, it, it's it's how do we do that for some of the older uh, equipment or even some of the mid-age equipment that we don't have upon our replacement cycle anytime soon. So uh, the it last the point I wanted to make here, just the in-room sensors as well as one of those things that going back to the that dashboard capability of having the ability for an attendee and someone in our one of our meeting rooms or conference rooms, you know, see what the conditions are in that um, in that room and obviously make requests uh, through that dashboard. That would be uh, great uh, as a two-way communication there or one-way communication even. Hey Jeff, can we go back to that for a second and just talk about that? Um, sure. Because you showed on one of your first slides, you had the dashboard that could be publicly seen um now some of those metrics were you know hard to discern especially for a non-informed public um and then the in-room sensors would that be a dashboard for like a larger room or is it just a sensor then that feeds the public dashboard that may be out in the hallway uh so we would like to look oh my good yeah so we would like to look at both uh, public areas, so the the major corridors and, and hallways, but also uh, importantly in the meeting rooms themselves, um, so that we have that ability to uh, read. Right now, most of our sensor and control points are in the air handlers in the ductwork, so uh, or at the equipment itself, so VAV boxes uh, back to the air handlers or any type of um, you know key. Uh, key uh, junction box areas. So we don't have a lot of intel on the conditions inside the breathing room space. And if, for those of you that are, you know, uh, lead and ASHRAE geeks out there, I mean, that breathing zone uh, is really important that we can track and see what's going on at that six to 12 foot of the, uh, at the at the meeting space itself. So you could have uh, like a So screen. we don't have that ability right now. Right, so you could have a screen, you know, some, in some conference centers, they'll have some kind of digital screen in front of the room um, that will say, hey, the session here is you know, X, Y, and Z, whatever. But you could also have um, some kind of display or whatever about the, the quality of the air in the room or, or maybe when it, was right. the, or when it was ventilated last or something. So anything that makes somebody confident to go in. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point. Like we can, we could do something that uh, if, if this room has was been recently sanitized and when was it recently sanitized? Not just cleaning, like, you know, I'm, I'm sure everyone has noticed in the bathrooms, a little checklist of the person that initialed yeah, the yeah. last clean, but a little bit more sophisticated than that. It's like, you know, this room was deep clean and sanitized with uh, UV, you know, at, at this last point or whatever that is, just to, to show how we turn these buildings and really, um, visualize our back of house operations that people don't even realize that we, we do, like the level of, of cleaning that we do and that turnover process, as I mentioned with the GBAC STAR certification, there's a certain procedure that we follow. How do we visualize that procedure and let people know that what has occurred before they step into that space? Now, that's really cool because, I mean, you know, we're planning to be there in October, uh, maybe twice. And so I was just thinking about that. And yeah, having something like that would make it really like confident that you could go into the convention center and into the meeting rooms. Sure. Um, also, foreign contaminants, actually really uh, interesting. We've not had, uh, you know, too much experience with testing these types of technologies for any type of foreign contaminants. Um, but obviously from a security and resilience standpoint, we want to evaluate uh, how could we early detect uh, foreign contaminants that are in the HVAC system or in the water supply, whatever it is. Uh, you know, that's something that uh, we would love to see how we can do that. Obviously in other high security facilities, this is 
a specification that is done, um, but such as a hospital, for example, but we'd love to see how we can get some of that uh, tech to get some more intel from a safety and security standpoint. And uh, the static pressure, I have it here, but just to clarify, that's static pressure at the air handler and uh, or even at filter. So that's a we we do have some static pressure monitors in some of the filters and some of the air handlers, but uh, it has been very costly to do those retrofits on our older equipment. So we'd be looking for some uh, newer tech that we could evaluate um, to make that a little bit easier for us. Um, and also, I just wanted to mention this bipolar ionization, you know, it's kind of been the thing that we've done through our other county facilities that are much smaller and manageable, but we uh, would like to evaluate to see what type of UV or ionization within the air uh, HVAC system we could install within reason and with, with the scale that we have. Uh, we have just in the north-south building alone, uh, 100 air handler units uh, of this size, like this picture right here. And then in the West building, I think it's like 60 or 70 air handlers uh, that we have in that building. So when you think of these small little retrofit projects uh, that we can add by polarization, it's been ra rather easy for us in other facilities, but this facility, just the scale has been a, a, a prohibitive uh, for us to even encounter, you know, to even start that process. So to what level of ionization uh, could we do or uh, air cleaning or UV cleaning uh, that could be easily replicated throughout um, the building? So we can start small and see where that goes. Uh, to that point too, it's also very uh, interesting because as we have been responding to new clients that want to have a show at our facility, they ask these questions. What is our HVAC protocols? Like what is our indoor air quality protocols, um, cleaning protocols? So um, I, I will be able to provide you all with some of that messaging so you can see how we communicate currently um, because it's, it's incredibly important. You can see how that drives business and it's a true concern going back to that point that I was making before of that confidence uh, of having a safe experience at the convention center so that we can be proactive and not just wait to get asked we will be able to promote and showcase uh, the work that we've done to make this building um, as safe as possible um, so just for some context and i left this here for, for reference for uh, for for later and obviously everyone will receive a copy of this but our building automation systems, we have JCI and Honeywell. Just want to quickly run through these. Our door systems, Linnell, Fire, uh, we use a simplex system. And then for lighting controls, which is only partially available, uh, we do have Lutron in some of the areas. Um, and then our CCTV, we have an Aglion. So this, from a system integration standpoint, we'd be open to different technologies that can obviously interface with that software that we already have. Um, and even some of those softwares right now, we're look, we are upgrading and uh, buying new. So uh, again, this is an opportunity to um, and further enhance what we already have and anything that we're doing new. Um, so let's see, I, uh, Philip, I think this is my last slide and really just wanted to leave this for uh, our question and answer session is uh, what information from us is helpful to uh, really get the, the the answers and the responses from a discovery and development at this phase on what type of technologies are out there in order to meet our goals and provide that you know uh, pre pre procurement if you'd like to call it like that hey discovery we're discovering different technologies we'd like to see use and how they specifically apply to us and making them you know the next level if not just a, a one-sided uh, product um, showcase, but now knowing some deep information or some more deep information about our use case here, um, how can we be more uh, productive and two-way with our um, providing some information so that we get a good uh, response? So just wanted to provide that and leave you all with that. Of course, we'll provide uh, everything we can um, in advance uh, so that uh, anyone that 
wants to engage on, on this level as the sufficient information from us um, equitably. So uh, that's all I have, Philip, and we can, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so I'm gonna show my screen because we'll talk a little bit about the process. So um, let me just take it back. Jeff, I think, see if you can go on and make me the presenter. Um, there we go. Okay, got it. Okay. Okay, your beautiful face again. Um, so, uh, what I'm gonna go through quickly is some of the process and just show you some of the places that we're gonna ask you to do some of the work and the schedule. I think Jeff has really laid out um, what the use cases are, which will, um, and what would really help us is if anybody on this call, if um, the, on that uh, last slide, number 17, which you'll get a copy of, if you have a specific request so you know you could use a drawing of this or you could understand the specifications of this just email me and we'll put it together uh, in a way that again per jeff's point everybody can get equitable access um and uh and then that does start you know considering what kind of solutions are available because one of our goals here is really to increase the solution set for orange county um and so with that said i'm just going to quickly go over a couple of things um, just defining our role, because there have been some questions about this. Um, we're here to assist Orange, Orange County in defining the, their needs and managing sort of an online collaboration process so that um, there's equitable sharing of information. Um, so, you know, we'll, if you're an academic expert, if you're a consulting expert, if you're a solution provider, and you have some ideas about how to address um, or some solutions, then we'll give you sort of the form and the ability to present those. We might want to make it clear that the procurement process is outside the scope of this engagement. This is all pre-procurement. We're helping Orange County accelerate. Um, you heard Jeff talk about the fact that they have clients that want to start using the convention center. Um, as a matter of fact, I think Jeff confirmed for me earlier in the day that um, there's going to start being events at the convention center in June. We ourselves are planning to be there in October. And so, um, so there is a, a somewhat, um, you know, uh, let's get to business and see what we can do to improve the health and safety of the convention center. And that's gonna prove to be a um, somewhat of a template for some of the other buildings that we're looking at. So, um, so we really need your help in this. Um, if you're a city, um, you know, you should reach out and ask questions. You can listen and learn. Um, if you're an expert or you've worked with the city and you have an idea where another city could give some ideas, uh, again, you should feel free to do that. Um, if you have solutions that you think would be applicable here, um, you know, we're going to have invite-only sessions in uh, July and August, and, and you should really feel, reach out to us, and, and we'll include you if we think it's relevant. Um, we're going to provide a solution provider toolkit, which is going to be made up of the online collaborative platform that I'll show you in a second, but it's also going to include some of the information that Jeff had on slide 17. And we're still in the process of putting that together. So any of you that are experts or solution providers that have specific ideas of what would help you help us, then you should let us know. Um, uh, and also there's gonna be an opportunity just to sort of outside of this whole process, if you have an innovative solution, then I've had several experts and solution providers told me they thought they had some really good ideas, um, you know, present them to us um, and, and, you know, we'll try to uh, get them to Orange County in an accelerated fashion. And again, you'll get a copy of this. So it's it's easy enough. The process is, is just send me a short email. We'll consult with Jeff and, and some of the other um, key evaluators and decision makers. And if we think it's applicable and something that we'd love to see further developed, then we'll give you a workspace in which you can work with us collaboratively to develop that solution. Um, what I just want to briefly show you is, Jeff, can you see my screen, um, the activator? 
Yes. yes. Okay, cool. So we've put together um, these workspaces, and I'm going to give you an example in a second. Um, uh, Jeff just talked about the Orange County Convention Center. Um, We've also talked about the fact that we're looking at all the other critical buildings in Orange County. Um, and then also Jeff mentioned the security use cases. And when I get back to the schedule, I'll, we'll talk about that briefly because that's gonna be a separate private session. But essentially what you're gonna see when you come to work in this space is a description of what the project is. It's security at the convention center, it's critical buildings, whatever. And then you're gonna see a number of use cases, as you can see here. This is a, an EV 5G example of, a, of, of, of projects for EV infrastructure. We've put this together. We're actually gonna use this uh, later in our sessions about how, um, because one of the key requirements out of this project is um, Orange County wants to go from 30 to 500 EV charging stations, and how do you do it? How do you do it within the built infrastructure, both public and private? So um, you'd see something. So on this one, for instance, you can see where you know we've identified the vision, the drivers, stakeholders. You know, you put together a whole list, and we'll be doing the stakeholder list. But this is just an example of you see the stakeholders. If this loads up, and um, and we identify the stakeholders, so we know who the players are. Everything from you know customers to the center itself to solution providers um, and um, one of the key things then is you'll see use cases like here we have use cases on reliable connectivity for ev charging and we'll set out some of the problem statements which you know jeff just did in his uh, 17 slides but we'll obviously go into more detail and then you know you'll be asked to provide us with some of the uh, architecture, some of the solutions. So like here's an example of an architecture around EV infrastructure and 5G. And, um, and in some cases, we'll present you with some of the proposed architecture. In other cases, you'll present it to us. But the idea here is, is then once we can see what your solution is, we can get together and uh, collaborate and we can do it all online so that, um, so that we can, um, uh, 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 work together. Um, so one of the questions I just got asked, which is perfect, was, is there an RFI process? And um, I do not want to call this an RFI process because we really are not within the procurement process of Orange County. I'm calling it a pre-procurement process. And you may consider that a matter of semantics. Um, but the point here is, is that um, we need to move quickly in accelerating and helping Orange County develop these projects with solutions. So, you know, if you consider this an RFI process, that's fine. We consider this a pre-procurement. Uh, what the words that Jeff used was discovery and development. Um, and again, that for you may be semantics, but the whole idea here is that we will give you some of the requirements and we'll give you a workspace and then you'll work with us. Um, in some cases, you may say, well, geez, why do we have to use this workspace? And frankly, it's because um, this is collaborative, it's online. Um, we can also share it with other cities, which is one of our goals. Orange County has agreed that whatever we put together for them, that we can share with other cities around the world. So if you participate in this, there'll be an opportunity for other cities to see how do they make their buildings um, healthy and smart. So I'm just giving you sort of an overview um, and obviously, if you reach out to me and you want a deeper dive into this, we can do it. But, you know, the whole idea is to do different types of, you know, architecture. Diet. And these are all things that you're familiar with. It's, it's not that you haven't seen this. It's just you've probably done it or seen it in a different um, sort of framework. And this framework is specifically intended to, um, to accelerate. So, you know, if you're invited in, You'll come into each of these use cases or these projects. You'll be given a workspace. Uh, you'll see the use cases, and you'll be asked to provide us information about your solutions. And you know, and if you have an innovative solution that's outside one of our use cases, then you just need to let me know, and we'll set up a workspace, and you can prepare it and you can present it to us. So, 
Yeah. Uh, just to add on the uh, RFI RFP process, uh, obviously there are several projects, as I mentioned, the last uh, kickoff, that they're already in our procurement procedure, developing RFP language to put out to formal bid. So uh, again, this process is happening in order to help us enhance our specifications for the RFPs and help write some better language in order to meet some of these goals that are newer goals uh, since some of that language uh, tends to uh, be recycled throughout. We can now change it in order to help achieve some of our goals and be more specific. So uh, more specific to the intent of the goals. So hopefully that uh, provides some uh, and then also we, we do have other uh, we have a variety of different procurement mechanisms that um, well, I'll, I'll make sure we provide that as part of this toolkit as far as like, like this is how we do business and here's how we can do business in any what capacity. So uh, the point of this engagement is to kind of go through that, uh, seeing if the technology is right, of course, and then also um, to make sure that you know everyone is, is meeting the, the guidelines and requirements that we have at the same time all the more fun stuff. Thank you, Dave. Yeah, no, and that's yeah, I appreciate that. I just want to make it clear to people that um, we're working outside the procurement process. That is, the council is the, the engagement, um, and you know we're not getting paid by the by the the county because this is part of our um, a grant process which the county won. Um, but the way, however, the county uses it is up to the county. So you'll, as you said, you'll use it to help improve your current RFPs. You'll also help to use it to accelerate. Um, um, requirements that you have in the pipeline, and, and that's where we come in. So that's really that's good to know. Um, again, everybody's going to get a copy of this. Um, you know, today was the 29th. We talked about the convention center. There is going to be an invite-only webinar about security upgrade requirements at the convention center. We haven't set a date yet. If you're interested in participating, please email me. Um, we do have to vet uh, those participating just for security requirements. Um, and you can go through the process on October, I'm sorry, May 13th. Um, we're gonna bring in some of the other communities and utilities to talk about how they're gonna participate in this. I do wanna point out on May 13th at 5 p.m., um, you'll remember that Jeff talked about one of the key aspects of this program was the human experience. And um, we, have, uh, we have both Nashville and Orange County, uh, Nashville's our other North American winner, who are going to participate together on this um, a webinar, and we're going to look at some really innovative solutions around using, um, you know, non-IoT, non-time series data to start determining what is the human experience of the built environment or a community. We have a company out of Australia. We have some other companies, um, both big and startups, that will present um, how we can sort of ethically improve the human experience used with community data. I'm really excited about this. I hope many of you can participate. It's part of Infrastructure Week. But just you'll all, like I said, get a copy of this um, pretty much through June uh, um, June 25th. We're going to be do general high-end requirements. Uh, describe, you know, we'll describe, we'll talk about the GBAC lead, net zero carbon. We'll we'll bring in some other cities from around the world as to what they're doing. And then starting um, in July and August, going into October, we're going to really um, we're going to really focus on solutions, and we're going to get um, experts and solution providers to talk about how they can address these. And remember, you're not only talking to Orange County; you're talking to all the other cities participating. Usually, we have anywhere from 20 to 30 other cities that listen in and participate. There'll be a scoping workshop in October. Uh, this is what I was talking about, where we'll be physically present at the convention center. And the idea here is to take all the work we've done online and um, and really sort of bring it to a fine point. Now, obviously, even before we hit October, um, Orange County is going to be issuing some RFPs uh, and doing some procurement. Um, so some of that's going to happen as we go through this process, but then there'll be other things more long term that we'll be looking at. Um, we'll be in Orlando, uh, October 6th through 9th at the WIA Connect X, and then we'll also have a digital twin later on in, in October. So that's it for the moment. Um, we've, we've just hit the hour. I appreciate everybody's time. Any last thoughts, Jeff, before we sign off? 
That said, I'll be available for questions if anyone wants to stay on. Uh, and I appreciate everyone's time. And thank you, Philip. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, everybody. They're all signing off, Jeff. Connie, I wasn't able to see attendees on here. You were, or you weren't. I was not, no. Yeah, I'm gonna send that to you. Hang on one second, it's Philip. Hold on. Hold on, Philip. I'm just not finishing up with Jeff. Hold on. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, I'll send uh, you okay. the I'll send you the attendees in a few minutes. Okay. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. All right. Talk to you. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.